Direct Action Day the 16th of August 1946, also known as the Great Calcutta Killings, was a day of widespread communal rioting between Muslims and Hindus in the city of Calcutta now known as Kolkata in the Bengal province of British India. The day also marked the start of what is known as the Week of the Long Knives. The Direct Action was announced by the Muslim League Council to show the strength of Muslim feelings towards its demand for an autonomous and sovereign Pakistan. The action resulted in the worst communal riots that British India had seen. The Muslim League and the Indian National Congress were the two largest political parties in the Constituent Assembly of India in the 1940s. The Muslim League had demanded, since its 1940 Lahore Resolution, that the Muslim-majority areas of India in the North West and the East, should be constituted as independent states. The 1946 Cabinet Mission to India for planning of the transfer of power from the British Raj to the Indian leadership proposed a three-tier structure, a centre, groups of provinces, and provinces. The groups of provinces were meant to accommodate the Muslim League demand. Both the Muslim League and Congress in principle accepted the Cabinet Mission's plan. However, Muslim League suspected that Congress's acceptance was insincere. Consequently, in July 1946, it withdrew its agreement to the plan and announced a general strike Hartle on 16 August, terming it as Direct Action Day, to assert its demand for a separate Muslim homeland. Against a backdrop of communal tension, the protest triggered massive riots in Calcutta. More than 4,000 people lost their lives and 100,000 residents were left homeless in Calcutta within 72 hours. This violence sparked off further religious riots in the surrounding regions of Nokali, Bihar, United Provinces, modern Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, and the northwestern frontier province. These events sowed the seeds for the eventual partition of India. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Background In 1946, the Indian independence movement against the British Raj had reached a pivotal stage. British Prime Minister Clement Attlee sent a three-member cabinet mission to India aimed at discussing and finalising plans for the transfer of power from the British Raj to the Indian leadership. After holding talks with the representatives of the Indian National Congress and the All India Muslim League—the two largest political parties in the Constituent Assembly of India— on 16 May 1946, the mission proposed a plan of composition of the new Dominion of India and its government. The Muslim League demand for «autonomous and sovereign» states in the northwest and the east was accommodated by creating a new tier of «groups of provinces between the provincial layer and the central government». The central government was expected to handle the subjects of defence, external affairs and communications. All other powers would be relegated to the groups. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the one time congressman and Indian nationalist, and now the leader of the Muslim League, had accepted the cabinet mission plan of 16 June, as had the central presidium of the Congress. On 10 July, however, Jawaharlal Nehru, the Congress president, held a press conference in Bombay declaring that although the Congress had agreed to participate in the Constituent Assembly, it reserved the right to modify the cabinet mission plan as it saw fit. Fearing Hindu domination in the Constituent Assembly, Jinnah rejected the British Cabinet Mission plan for transfer of power to an interim government which would combine both the Muslim League and the Indian National Congress, and decided to boycott the Constituent Assembly. In July 1946, Jinnah held a press conference at his home in Bombay. He proclaimed that the Muslim League was preparing to launch a struggle, and that they have chalked out a plan. He said that if the Muslims were not granted a separate Pakistan then they would launch direct action. When asked to be specific, Jinnah retorted, Go to the Congress and ask them their plans. When they take you into their confidence I will take you into mine. Why do you expect me alone to sit with folded hands? I also am going to make trouble. The next day, Jinnah announced 16 August 1946 would be direct action day and warned Congress. We do not want war. If you want war we accept your offer unhesitatingly. We will either have a divided India divided or a destroyed India." In his book The Great Divide, H. V. Hodson recounted, "...the working committee followed up by calling on Muslims throughout India to observe 16 August as direct action day. On that day, meetings would be held all over the country to explain the League's resolution." 
These meetings and processions passed off as was manifestly the Central League leader's intention without more than commonplace and limited disturbances, with one vast and tragic exception. What happened was more than anyone could have foreseen. In Muslim societies, historical and comparative aspects, edited by Sato Sugitaka, Nakazato Nariaki writes, from the viewpoint of institutional politics, the Calcutta disturbances possessed a distinguishing feature in that they broke out in a transitional period which was marked by the power vacuum and systemic breakdown. It is also important to note that they constituted part of a political struggle in which the Congress and the Muslim League competed with each other for the initiative in establishing the new nation-states, while the British made an all-out attempt to carry out decolonization at the lowest possible political cost for them. The political rivalry among the major nationalist parties in Bengal took a form different from that in New Delhi, mainly because of the broad mass base those organizations enjoyed and the tradition of flexible political dealing in which they excelled. At the initial stage of the riots, the Congress and the Muslim League appeared to be confident that they could draw on this tradition even if a difficult situation arose out of political showdown. Most probably, Direct Action Day in Calcutta was planned to be a large-scale hartle and mass rally which is an accepted part of political culture in Calcutta which they knew very well how to control. However, the response from the masses far exceeded any expectations. The political leaders seriously miscalculated the strong emotional response that the word nation, as interpreted under the new situation, had evoked. In August 1946 the nation was no longer a mere political slogan. It was rapidly turning into reality both in realpolitik and in people's imaginations. The system to which Bengal political leaders had grown accustomed for decades could not cope with this dynamic change. As we have seen, it quickly and easily broke down on the first day of the disturbances. <laughs> Prelude Since the 11 to 14 February 1946 riots in Calcutta, communal tension had been high. Hindu and Muslim newspapers whipped up public sentiment with inflammatory and highly partisan reporting that heightened antagonism between the two communities. Following Jinnah's declaration of the 16th of August as the Direct Action Day, acting on the advice of R. L. Walker, the then Chief Secretary of Bengal, the Muslim League Chief Minister of Bengal, Hussein Shahid Surawardi, requested Governor of Bengal Sir Frederick Burroughs to declare a public holiday on that day. Governor Burroughs agreed. Walker made this proposal with the hope that the risk of conflicts, especially those related to picketing, would be minimized if government offices, commercial houses and shops remained closed throughout Calcutta on the 16th. The Bengal Congress protested against the declaration of a public holiday, arguing that a holiday would enable the idle folks to successfully enforce hartles in areas where the Muslim League leadership was uncertain. Congress accused the League government of having indulged in communal politics for a narrow goal. Congress leaders thought that if a public holiday was observed, its own supporters would have no choice but to close down their offices and shops, and thus be compelled against their will to lend a hand in the Muslim League's hartle. On 14 August, Chiron Shankar Roy, a leader of the Congress party in the Bengal Legislative Assembly, called on Hindu shopkeepers to not observe the public holiday, and keep their businesses open in defiance of the hartle. In essence, there was an element of pride involved in that the monopolistic position that the Congress had hitherto enjoyed in imposing and enforcing hartles, strikes, etc. was being challenged. However, the League went ahead with the declaration, and Muslim newspapers published the program for the day. The Star of India, an influential local Muslim newspaper, edited by Raghib Asan Muslim League MLA from Calcutta published detailed program for the day. The program called for complete hartle and general strike in all spheres of civic, commercial and industrial life except essential services. The notice proclaimed that processions would start from multiple parts of Calcutta, Howrah, Hooghly, Mishabruz and 24 Parganas, and would converge at the foot of the Akhtarloni Monument now known as Shahid Minar where a joint mass rally presided over by Hussein Shahid Surawardi would be held. The Muslim League branches were advised to depute three workers in every mosque in every ward to explain the League's action plan before Juma prayers. Moreover, special prayers were arranged in every mosque on Friday after Juma prayers for the freedom of Muslim India. 
The notice drew divine inspiration from the Quran, emphasizing on the coincidence of direct action day with the holy month of Ramzan, claiming that the upcoming protests were an allegory of Prophet Muhammad's conflict with heathenism and subsequent conquest of Mecca and establishment of the Kingdom of Heaven in Arabia. Hindu public opinion was mobilized around the Akhand Hindustan United India slogan. Certain Congress leaders in Bengal imbibed a strong sense of Hindu identity, especially in view of the perceived threat from the possibility of marginalizing themselves into minority against the onslaught of the Pakistan movement. Such mobilization along communal lines was partly successful due to a concerted propaganda campaign which resulted in a legitimization of communal solidarities. On the other hand, following the protests against the British after INA trials, the British administration decided to give more importance to protests against the government, rather than management of communal violence within the Indian populace, according to their emergency action scheme. Frederick Burroughs, the governor of Bengal, rationalized the declaration of public holiday in his report to Lord Wavell. Many of the mischief makers were people who would have had idle hands anyhow. If shops and markets had been generally open, I believe that there would have been even more looting and murder than there was. The holiday gave the peaceable citizens the chance of staying at home. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Riots and massacre. Troubles started on the morning of the 16th of August. Even before 10 o'clock police headquarters at Lalbazar had reported that there was excitement throughout the city, that shops were being forced to close, and that there were many reports of brawls, stabbing and throwing of stones and brickbats. These were mainly concentrated in the north-central parts of the city like Rajabazar, Kelabagan, College Street, Harrison Road, Kolotola and Bura Bazaar. In these areas the Hindus were in a majority and were also in a superior and powerful economic position. The trouble had assumed the communal character which it was to retain throughout. The League's rally began at Akhtarloni Monument at noon exactly. The gathering was considered as the largest ever Muslim assembly in Bengal at that time. The meeting began around 2 p.m. though processions of Muslims from all parts of Calcutta had started assembling since the midday prayers. A large number of the participants were reported to have been armed with iron bars and lathis bamboo sticks. The numbers attending were estimated by a central intelligence officer's reporter a Hindu at 30,000 and by a special branch inspector of Calcutta police a Muslim at 500,000. The latter figure is impossibly high and the Muslim Star of India reporter put it at about 100,000. The main speakers were Kawaja Nazimuddin and Chief Minister Surawardi. Nazimuddin in his speech preached peacefulness and restraint but rather spoilt the effect by asserting that till 11 o'clock that morning all the injured persons were Muslims, and the Muslim community had only retaliated in self-defense. The special branch of Calcutta police had sent only one Urdu shorthand reporter to the meeting, with the result that no transcript of the chief minister's speech is available. But the Central Intelligence Officer and a reporter, who Frederick Burroughs believed was reliable, deputed by the military authorities agree on one statement not reported at all by the Calcutta police. The version in the former's report was, he, the chief minister, had seen to police and military arrangements who would not interfere. The version of the latter's was, he had been able to restrain the military and the police. However, the police did not receive any specific order to hold back. So, whatever Surawardi may have meant to convey by this, the impression of such a statement on a largely uneducated audience is construed by some to be an open invitation to disorder indeed, many of the listeners are reported to have started attacking Hindus and looting Hindu shops as soon as they left the meeting. Subsequently, there were reports of lorries trucks that came down Harrison Road in Calcutta, carrying Muslim men armed with brickbats and bottles as weapons and attacking Hindu-owned shops. Hindus and Sikhs were just as fierce as the Muslims in the beginning. Parties of one community would lie in wait, and as soon as they caught one of the other community, they would cut him to pieces. A 6 p.m. curfew was imposed in the parts of the city where there had been rioting. At 8 p.m. troops were deployed to secure main routes and conduct patrols from those arteries, thereby freeing up police for work in the slum areas. On 17 August, Syed Abdullah Faruqui, the president of Garden Reach Textile Workers Union, along with Elian Mistry, a Muslim hooligan, led a Muslim mob into the mill compound of Kesoram Cotton Mills in the Lichabagan area of Mishabruz. The mill workers, among whom were a substantial number of Odias, used to stay in the mill compound itself. 
On the 25th of August, four survivors lodged a complaint at the Mishabru's police station against Faruqui. Biswanath Das, a minister in the government of Orissa, visited Lichabagan to investigate into the killings of the Oriya laborers of Kesoram Cotton Mills. Some sources put the death toll at 7,000 to 10,000. Some authors have claimed that most of the victims were Muslims. However, many authors claim that Hindus were the primary victims. The worst of the killing took place during the day on 17 August. By late afternoon soldiers brought the worst areas under control, and the army expanded its hold overnight. In the slums and other areas outside military control, however, lawlessness escalated. In the morning of 18 August, "...buses and taxis were charging about loaded with Sikhs and Hindus armed with swords, iron bars and firearms." Skirmishes between the communities continued for almost a week. Finally, on 21 August, Bengal was put under Viceroy's rule. Five battalions of British troops, supported by four battalions of Indians and Gurkhas, were deployed in the city. Lord Wavell alleged that more British troops ought to have been called in earlier, and there is no indication that more British troops were not available. The rioting reduced on the 22nd of August. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Characteristics of the riot. Surawardi put forth a great deal of effort to bring reluctant British officials around to calling the army in from sealed arrest camp. Unfortunately, British officials did not send the army out until 1.45 am on the 17th. Violence in Calcutta, between 1945 and 1946, passed by stages from Indian versus European to Hindu versus Muslim. Indian Christians and Europeans were generally free from molestation as the tempo of Hindu Muslim violence quickened. The decline of anti-European feelings as communal Hindu-Muslim tensions increased during this period is evident from the casualty numbers. During the riots of November 1945, casualty of Europeans and Christians were 46. In the riots of the 10 to 14 February 1946, 35. From the 15th of February to the 15th of August, only three. During the Calcutta riots from the 15th of August 1946 to the 17th of September 1946, none. Aftermath During the riots, thousands began fleeing Calcutta. For several days the Howrah Bridge over the Hooghly River was crowded with evacuees headed for the Howrah Station to escape the mayhem in Calcutta. Many of them would not escape the violence that spread out into the region outside Calcutta. Lord Wavell claimed during his meeting on 27 August 1946 that Gandhi had told him, if India wants bloodbath she shall have it if a bloodbath was necessary, it would come about in spite of non-violence." There was criticism of Surawardi, chief minister in charge of the home portfolio in Calcutta, for being partisan and of Sir Frederick John Burroughs, the British governor of Bengal, for not having taken control of the situation. The chief minister spent a great deal of time in the control room in the police headquarters at Lalbazar, often attended by some of his supporters. Short of a direct order from the governor, there was no way of preventing the chief minister from visiting the control room whenever he liked, and Governor Burroughs was not prepared to give such an order, as it would clearly have indicated complete lack of faith in him. Prominent Muslim League leaders spent a great deal of time in police control rooms directing operations and the role of Surawardi in obstructing police duties as documented both the British and Congress blamed Jinnah for calling the Direct Action Day and the Muslim League was seen responsible for stirring up the Islamic nationalism sentiment, there are several views on the exact cause of the Direct Action Day riots. The Hindu press blamed the Surawardi government and the Muslim League. According to the authorities, riots were instigated by members of the Muslim League and its affiliate Volunteer Corps, in the city in order to enforce the declaration by the Muslim League that Muslims were to suspend all business to support their demand for an independent Pakistan. However, supporters of the Muslim League believed that the Congress party was behind the violence in an effort to weaken the fragile Muslim League government in Bengal. Historian Hoya Chatterjee allocates much of the responsibility to Surawardi, for setting up the confrontation and failing to stop the rioting, but points out that Hindu leaders were also culpable. Members of the Indian National Congress, including Mohandas Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru responded negatively to the riots and expressed shock. The riots would lead to further rioting and pogroms between Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims. 
These events sowed the seeds for the eventual partition of India. <inaudible> Further rioting in India The Direct Action Day riots sparked off several riots between Muslims and Hindus, Sikhs in Nokali, Bihar, and Punjab in that year. <inaudible> Nokali riots An important sequel to Direct Action Day was the massacre in Nokali and Tipura districts in October 1946. News of the Great Calcutta riot touched off the Nokali Tipura riot in reaction. However, the violence was different in nature from Calcutta. Rioting in the districts began on 10 October 1946 in the area of northern Nokali district under Ramganj police station. The violence unleashed was described as the organized fury of the Muslim mob. It soon engulfed the neighboring police stations of Raipur, Lakshmipur, Bagumganj and Sandeep in Nokali, and Faridganj, Hajaganj, Chandpur, Laksham and Chudagram in Tipura. The disruption caused by the widespread violence was extensive, making it difficult to accurately establish the number of casualties. Official estimates put the number of dead between 200 and 300. After the riots were stopped in Nokali, the Muslim League claimed that only 500 Hindus were killed in the mayhem, but the survivors opined that more than 50,000 Hindus were killed. Some sources also made some extreme claim that the Hindu population in Nokali was nearly annihilated. According to Francis Tucker, who at the time of the disturbances was General Officer Commanding-in-Chief, Eastern Command, India, the Hindu press intentionally and grossly exaggerated reports of disorder. The neutral and widely accepted death toll figure is around 5,000. According to Governor Burroughs, the immediate occasion for the outbreak of the disturbances was the looting of a bazaar market in Ramganj police station following the holding of a mass meeting. This included attacks on the place of business of Surendra Nath Bose and Rajendra Lal Roy Choudhury, the erstwhile president of the Nokali Bar and a prominent Hindu Mahasabha leader. <laughs> Bihar and rest of India A devastating riot rocked Bihar towards the end of 1946. Between 30 October and 7 November, a large-scale massacre of Muslims in Bihar brought partition closer to inevitability. Severe violence broke out in Chopra and Saran district, between 25 and 28 October. Very soon Patna, Munger and Bagalpur also became the sites of serious violence. Begun as a reprisal for the Nokali riot, whose death toll had been greatly overstated in immediate reports, it was difficult for authorities to deal with because it was spread out over a large area of scattered villages, and the number of casualties was impossible to establish accurately. According to a subsequent statement in the British Parliament, the death toll amounted to 5,000. The statesman's estimate was between 7,500 and 10,000, the Congress party admitted to 2,000, Jinnah claimed about 30,000. However, by 3 November, the official estimate put the figure of death at only 445. According to some independent sources of today, the death toll was around 8,000 human lives. Some of the worst rioting also took place in Garmukteshwar in United Provinces, where a massacre occurred in November 1946, in which Hindu pilgrims, at the annual religious fair, set upon and exterminated Muslims, not only on the festival grounds but in the adjacent town. While the police did little or nothing, the deaths were estimated at between 1,000 and 2,000. Rioting also took place in Punjab and Northwest Frontier Province in late 1946 and early 1947. 